All right, welcome everyone to the second track for International Women's Day North America Summit. I'd like to welcome Magda and Joelle, who will kick it off sharing all that Google Cloud has to offer to help you boost your cloud career. Hello, everyone. I'm Magda Yare, and I'm the global lead for Google Cloud Certification and Digital Badges Go to Market. Today's talk is focused on the courage to create your cloud career and what Google Cloud has to offer to help you on this journey, including certifications, skill badges, and recommended learning paths. We'll also talk with Joelle about her experience and advice on earning a Google Cloud certification with tips and tricks for success. Hello, Joelle. Let's take a look at our agenda today. We will provide an overview of Google Cloud Learning available and then deep dive on Google Cloud certifications. Then we'll hear from Joelle about her experience and advice in preparing for her Google Cloud Certification exam and share some examples of learning paths to help you prepare, including skill badges. We'll finish up inviting you with the opportunity to join the Google Cloud Skills Challenge to earn skill, uh, Google Cloud skill badges and start your learning journey with Google Cloud to boost your cloud career. So let's get started. Let's take a look at the Google Cloud Learning offering to help you grow your cloud career. Growing your cloud skills and developing your career in cloud takes courage. Google Learning provides a comprehensive curriculum, customizable depending on where you are in your journey, combining a range of tools to deliver learning across different modalities. This basically means we have a ton of different kinds of learning, of different ways in for all the different learners in your organization. We have the instructor-led training, the on-demand training, some hands-on labs, as well as the Google Cloud certifications validating your knowledge. So let's take a closer look at the Google Cloud certifications. In having courage to create, confidence in your cloud capability is key. And we have surveyed our Google Cloud certified community last year and 85% of those who obtained a Google Cloud certification felt more confident in their cloud skills as a result. There are so some additional results of this survey. Having confidence helps in creating the cloud career you aspire to. With Google Cloud certification, those uh, we have certified um, and responded to our survey feel more confidence in their professional future they can provide proof they have the competency, it makes their resume more appealing, and it provides them with that confidence in their cloud knowledge, skills, and experience. Here are some of the benefits you can enjoy uh, when earning your Google Cloud certification. You can proudly display your achievement in the format of a digital badge and a certificate, so showcase your achievement. You can network with other um, community members who are also certified. And uh, for our professional level certifications, we also offer dedicated swag. So our proficiency and role-based certifications provide you with a benchmark for success. So that's a really great, valuable milestone to aspire to. So finally, let's take a look at the exams in our portfolio. Here are the Google Cloud certifications. You can see we have the exams on the professional level as well as, as the associate level. What you may notice is that our exams are validating a proficiency on a, a given job role level. So whether that's data engineer, cloud architect, they all focus around a given job role. And what is really critical for success is a practical experience in a job role. So uh, we invite you to approach these exams when you are ready, when you have the practical experience, ranging from uh, roughly a year of experience to over three for our professional exams. 
And you may wonder, what is the difference? What is the difference in scope of our Google Cloud certifications? And the way I like to explain it is, if we think about the overall customer implementation project, we talk about technical requirements as well as business requirements. And our associate level certification will specifically focus on these technical requirements. Uh, in addition to this, for our professional exams, uh, we're also adding this lens of business requirements. So being able to lead a project team through um, decisions that uh, then apply to the overall customer implementation. A little bit more about our exams. They are two hours long. When it comes to the exam format, there are multiple choice and multiple select. There are no prerequisites. However, it's really important to approach them when you have the actual real life, real life and hands-on experience with um, the Google Cloud um, technology. When it comes to the exam delivery method, you can take your exam online via the online proctoring uh, mode or you can approach them in a dedicating testing center. So if you are thinking about the online proctored option, make sure you check the requirements, um, technical requirements that need to be met beforehand. And for all, uh, both of these options, I highly encourage you to book your exam in advance to assure that there is availability. So we really uh, hope that you will explore these um, really valuable credentials, our certifications under cloud.google.com slash certification, and you'll be able to earn your badge um, to probably display uh, in your network and validate your experience in this field. And I'm really delighted to welcome Joelle, uh, who is uh, certified herself. Uh, to s share some of her experience and her story about her motivation about the exam, her readiness experience, and any other tips and tricks uh, she may have for us. Hello, Joelle. So the first question for you, what was your motivation to approach uh, the certification exam? Thank you. And how did you approach your certification preparation experience? Thank you for sharing. What was the impact of preparing for the exam and achieving the certification on your career? Thank you. And any tips you'd like to leave our audience with today? Thank you for sharing. And uh, finally, what's next for you? Thank you so much for your insights and tips today, Joelle. Really appreciate it. So let's take a closer look now at the journey to certification. What are some of the resources available to support your preparation? And we'll take a look at this example of the Associate Cloud Engineer journey to certification. Uh, and we have all these resources available on our external Google Cloud training websites. Uh, the structure is relatively similar though. So I wanted to highlight the trainings that are available on your journey. They are available in the on-demand format for your convenience. Uh, you also gain some uh, hands-on experience by completing self-paced labs. And you also have some additional resources available on your journey towards your certification readiness. One of these milestones that's really important and valuable on your certification readiness journey would be a Google Cloud Skill Badge. And a Google Cloud Skill Badge, it's an exclusive digital badge that helps you demonstrate and hone your growing Google Cloud recognized competencies as cloud technology advances. And this badge allows businesses to identify the cloud capabilities in their organization. Specifically, uh, how can you earn a skill badge? Uh, the skill badge is earned by completing a series of hands-on labs and taking a final assessment challenge lab to test your skills through the Quick Labs learning platform. You may notice here uh, we have a variety of uh, skill badges available, 
And uh, more on this is available under cloud.google.com slash training slash badges. Once you earn your skill badge, we highly encourage you to share it with your network, show it to the world uh, that you have demonstrated the hands-on um, ability in a given uh, skills area. So we'd like to leave you today with an invitation to join our skills challenge and earn some of, your, uh, of these skill badges, hopefully on your way uh, towards certification readiness. And to get us started here, I would like to uh, play this video that introduces the skills challenge. So let's take a look. Are you looking to build and showcase your cloud skills? Want an easy way to show them off? You can now earn skill badges from Google Cloud to demonstrate your growing cloud competencies. Here's how it works. First, you need to join the Google Cloud Skills Challenge. This gives you 30 days of free access to Google Cloud Labs. Then, choose the track you're interested in and get started. Each track has a number of skill badges up for grabs. To earn a badge, you'll need to complete a series of Google Cloud Labs. Then, you'll need to pass a final challenge lab designed to test your skills. Once you've earned a badge, showcase what you've learned. You can add it to your resume and share it with your network. Ready to go? Join the Google Cloud Skills Challenge today and start earning your skill badges. We hope you enjoyed the video. So we leave you with this call to action to visit the website g.co slash cloud slash skills challenge to start your journey uh, towards uh, cloud skills, um, enhancing your cloud career, and hopefully achieving a certification as well. Thank you so much for your attention today. Right now, we're going to break for 15 minutes. So feel free to stretch your limbs, grab a snack, and we'll see you all back here with the talk on designing high-performance networks on GCP when we return. Welcome to the International Women's Day Summit 2021. My name is Coach Annie, here to lead your movement break. In our session today, we'll be breathing, moving, and thinking intentionally to kickstart our minds and bodies for today's focus. No matter where you are in your fitness journey, be proud of yourself for being willing to participate and dive into some movement with me. The intention of this session is to invite some blood flow and movement to our neck, our shoulders, our spine, and even our hips. And of course, taking a nice little break from our desk or wherever you've been doing work this past year. I like to start each session with a theme. So today the theme is the power of human connection. There's links between connecting with others, whether it's talking on the phone or online, however you connect with others in longevity of life. So whenever you're feeling love or empathy or connection, that's when there's this chemical in our brain that's released called oxytocin that reduces inflammation and actually boosts your mood. So without further ado, let's go ahead, connect a little bit and get into our movement break. So joining me in a standing or seated position, however you're feeling this moment, we're gonna start with some breathing. So putting one hand on your chest, one hand on your tummy, all right? Hands move together with the inhale and exhale. So really focusing on elongating that exhale. And breathe with your mouth open or closed. Three more here. Relaxing those shoulders. All right, last one, longest exhale. All right, moving now to our neck, we're gonna go into neck circles. So it doesn't matter which, which direction you start with, but dropping that same ear to that same shoulder, thinking about your head drawing a big circle in the sky. Body is just feeling weightless here. Relaxing that jaw. Go ahead and give me one more this direction. Big circle. 
All right, let's go ahead, go the other direction, same thing. Drop that ear to that shoulder. Nice big circle. Taking your time. Noticing if there's any tight spots. Working around it. Last one here. All right, shake that out a little bit. We're gonna move on to our shoulders now, going into shoulder circles. So starting forward, I want you to be real dramatic with it. Open up that chest as you roll those shoulders back and through. Big inhale, long exhale. Giving yourself a nice little massage here. Last one this direction. All right, let's balance that out. Go in reverse. Go back now. Open up that chest. Give me two more here. Woo. Feels good. <laughs> so moving on now to our spine. So I'm going to show this from the side. Sewing from the standing position first, I'm going to tuck, roll. My knees are going to bend as I come down. I'm going to press my hand into my leg and open up to one side. Getting some rotation, take a deep breath here. Back to center and then switch to the other side. Not forcing anything here. All right, so if you're standing, continuing to do so. If you're seated, it's the same thing. You're pressing same hand or same arm into your leg and then opening up like a book. <sighs> Getting some mobility in that middle part of our spine, which is where a lot of our movement comes from. <sighs> Go ahead and give me one more each direction. Noticing with each rep, if you're able to get a little bit more rotation. <sighs> All right, awesome. So moving on now to our hips, we're gonna go into a hip shift. All right, so thinking, using your imagination, if you're standing, you're gonna send your hips back like you're seat sitting in a chair. All right, so send one hip back. You're gonna go ahead, reach for that foot, and then drive through the heel as you come back up. All right, so alternating side to side here. You're gonna sink up your breath, inhale down, exhale, back up. So if you're standing, continuing to do so. If you are seated, a little bit different here. You're gonna shift, so one knee comes forward, the other knee comes back. You're gonna reach for that opposite foot and then come back up and then switch to the other side. So opening up this back hip, all right, either you're standing or seated, same thing here, mobilizing that hip a little bit. This is a great way, if you're going for a walk or a run and you're just feeling really tight in your hips, this is a great way to open up. All right, give yourself a little bit more mobility. Go ahead and give me one more each side. Last one here. All right, beautiful. Last thing we're gonna do for the day, some cactus arms. All right, so really opening up that chest, relaxing that neck just a little bit more. Meet me with your hands down to your sides. Give me a big inhale up. Grab those imaginary ropes and then exhale. Bring those fists to your shoulders. All right, give me three more here. Inhale up. Exhale down. Elongate that exhale. Bring it up. And down. Last one here, inhale up, and exhale down. All right, awesome. Go ahead, make your way back to your seat or your desk. All right, I hope this movement break has your mind and body prepped. Let's go ahead, go down to our neck, going to some yeses, nos, and I don't knows. So starting off with some yeses here, going up, 
and down, not forcing anything, just let your body feel weightless. Breathing it out. Go ahead and give me one more here. Let's go into some nose next. All right, again, going within your range of motion, not forcing anything. Noticing if one side's a little tighter than the other. You can always hold it and breathe into it. One more each side. All right, last piece here. I don't know, so dropping same ear to same shoulder, side to side here. Trying not to shrug up your shoulder, but meeting your head to your shoulder instead. Let's go do one more each side. All right, so if you're standing, keep going into those tuck and rolls. For those who are seated, it's the same idea, but if you want to keep your legs there to lead as some guidance for your chest, or if you want to bring your legs apart so you can go a little bit further down, that's up to you. But tucking, rolling, allowing those arms just to be weightless, and then roll back up here. Tuck and roll one vertebrae at a time. Go ahead and give me three more here. Going at your own pace. All right, last one here. Whew, beautiful. So few more moves here. Marches are next. So I'm going to show from standing first. All right. It's very similar for seated, but showing from the side, thinking, pushing one foot into the ground, pulling with the other, bringing that knee up to hip level, and then coming back down. All right. For those of you who are seated, same idea here, pushing through the ground, pulling the other knee up to hip level, all right? Opposite arm, opposite leg here. <sighs> Feeling that stretch in your hip flexor, especially as you come up and then lower back down. <sighs> you can live here for a moment at the top if you'd like, get a little extra stretch in. <sighs> Go ahead and give me one more each side. <sighs> Last one here. All right, beautiful. So last moon for the day, we're gonna go into some cactus arms, opening up that chest a little bit, relaxing that neck even more. All right, so joining me with your hands to your sides, give me a big inhale up. Once those arms are up over your head, pretend you're pulling down imaginary ropes as you exhale. Long exhale. Three more here, inhale up. Exhale down. Bring it up again. And down. Last one here. Longest exhale. And down. All right. Awesome. Making your way back to your seats. All right. And back to your desks. I hope this movement break has your mind and body prepped to take on the day. Remember that you can use these moves daily whenever you just need to take a nice little break or just need to regain some focus and attention. If you like this and you're looking for more movement in your day, I invite you to check out go slash HMP at home for all of your health and wellness needs. Thank you so much for coming in. I hope you enjoyed it just as much as I did. Have a great rest of your day. Bye for now.
Welcome back, everyone. I would now like to hand it over to Stephanie Wong to share more on how Google Cloud's underlying physical fiber cable network and virtual network layer work together to increase performance and innovation. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the International Women's Day Summit. I am incredibly honored to be a speaker today as I am a big women in tech proponent. Um, I'm Stephanie Wong, Senior Developer Advocate at Google Cloud. Uh, for those of you who are joining my session, thank you so much for letting me share my knowledge, experience, and the opportunity to connect with you all. Um, today, I'll be covering our network backbone at Google Cloud and how you can design a high-performance network on GCP. Uh, just to give a little bit more background about myself, I mentioned that I'm a developer advocate. And what that means at Google Cloud is that we drive customer success by winning the hearts and minds of developers through inspiring and educating them about Google Cloud. Um, I am a speaker, a technologist, a writer, and a leader with a mission to blend storytelling and technology to create inspiring online developer content. At Google, I've created over 300 videos, blogs, courses, tutorials, and podcasts that have helped developers learn fundamentals, solve their toughest challenges, and pass certifications all over the world um, in the form of our largest conferences, as you see here, this is Google Cloud Next, podcasting, um, speaking on stage and creating technical videos, how-tos and interviews. Um, and over the past couple years, I've been doing a large portion of my content on networking, though I cover all products. Um, networking just has fascinated me because Google Cloud's network is so powerful uh, and so that's why today I want to talk about our high performance network. Um, at Google Cloud, our network is backed by innovations at every layer, both the physical infrastructure layer, which means our fiber cables, our data centers, and then also our Andromeda cloud layer, or what's also our software defined network, which I'll go into detail in just a bit. So just to start with our physical layer, which I mentioned is our fiber optic cables, our data centers. Um, as you can see here, our Google Cloud network in, in, is comprised of 24 cloud regions, 73 zones, which make up our regions, um, and then 144 POPs or uh, points of presence, which are our network edge locations. And we have over 100 CDN locations across over 200 countries, uh, across 19 data centers, 28 or 26 plus renewable energy project locations and over 16 subsea cable investments. Um, all these numbers are uh, what I know, but definitely check out documentation to find out the latest numbers. Um, but basically the message is that we cover our large span of the world. And some of our subsea cable investments over the last year have been super excited, exciting. For example, Dunant, which is between US and France and Kiri, which is between US and Chile. Uh, there are so many amazing innovations that Google Cloud users can inherit. For example, Do Not offers 250 terabits per second, which is uh, actually record breaking across the Atlantic. And that's enough to transmit the entire digitized library of Congress, Congress three times every second. Um, and then in addition, there, it's also the first to have 12 fiber pair space division multiplexing design, which essentially just increases the bandwidth capacity of the fiber pairs. And the good news is that uh, you can connect to this network at over 100 locations around the world, either directly or via an extensive network of partners. Um, some of these green locations are our dedicated interconnect locations where you can get direct physical connection to our network and dedicated bandwidth for low latency workloads. Uh, so essentially, it's never been easier to get on board our global network. So our infrastructure enables several tangible differentiators for GCP network. Uh, we have something called our premium tier network. Um, so cloud workloads mostly are comprised of compute and storage is a likely second. Both are fundamental. And the third but most fundamental is the network because it carries the data between your user or your customer to your applications running in the cloud and back. So it's, it's very pivotal in determining your customer or your user experience. Uh, on Google Cloud's network, we have the combination of speed and reliability. Um, so 
So this diagram is sort of illustrating what we mean by our premium tier network. Most cloud providers use what's called a hot potato routing, which is shown at the bottom here. When you're sending out traffic from their infrastructure, most cloud providers offload it to the public internet as soon as possible. And that traffic is a hot potato that they want to give, get off their hands. Uh, if you remember what you played as a little kid, maybe hot potato, cold potato. Um, so cold potato is what we employ, which means that we keep traffic on Google's private internet at a location nearest to the end user, usually in the same city or town as the user. And this enables us to offer much better reliability, performance, and also security. In a nutshell, it's, it's just better customer experience. Uh, but you can also leverage standard tier, which means that they're doing hot potato routing on other ISPs and the public internet. Uh, and that can actually be useful for any cost sensitive workloads because it does have a lower cost. And all of this, the premium tier network is possible through our software defined network, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, this is called Andromeda internally, and it's what enables our cloud network design. So let's just cover what a VPC or a virtual private cloud is. Uh, so a VPC, in the cloud, you need your own slice of the cloud. This is your virtual private network. And this means that you have your own logically isolated and secure piece of Google Cloud. It closely resembles a traditional network, something that you would operate in your own data center, but with the benefits of cloud scalable infrastructure. Um, GCP takes a more intuitive approach to v v excuse me, VPC peering by offering the concept of a shared VPC. This is illustrated in this visual here. Um, unlike other providers, GCP does not require that each project has to have its own separate network. Instead, you can actually create a single global or regional production shared VPC network within Google Cloud and then create unique production projects to isolate and organize resources appropriately. And essentially what GCP is offering customers is a shared VPC or VNet model out of the box without the hassle of setting things up. And then that means that you can actually centralize shared services like DNS, directory services, auditing, monitoring, security, and more. And it also allows you to have a single connectivity point to Google Cloud. Um, you also have cross-project standardization and control. And then as an added side benefit, network security is enhanced because traffic never traverses the public internet. Uh, instead, you have private connectivity across regions, even if you have instances or VMs sitting in US versus EMEA, um, they can all communicate with one another through a private subnet. Um, and then added also is resource hierarchy. So you don't need to be in the same project as the VPC. You can actually um, keep more of a consistent operational model and take your enterprise model into the cloud, expand subnet ranges without taking down the network. So all in all, it's really nice to be able to just have your network span multiple regions and not have to worry about you know, setting up VPNs between resources that sit in different locations. So let's just drill in just a little bit to give you an example here. Uh, we mentioned VPCs are global. They're not isolated to cloud regions. And this means that you don't need to spend time on regional replication of configurations and connectivity. And then also with shared VPCs, you can apply one policy globally across all service projects within the host project. Um, this global model gives you more flexibility to offer global scale. Um, and it's really, it's up to you how to put them together. Um, one really, really big part of our network portfolio is our layer seven global load balancer, which I'm gonna talk about in more detail. And this load balancer is basically how you accept ingress traffic into your backends or your backend virtual machines. Um, and you also get one global virtual IP for this load balancer, which is a unique capability of Google Cloud uh, but we also support network and internal load balancers at the regional level as well. And then you can use the different network tiers, which I talked about, in order to control how internet traffic flows in and out of the cloud. Um, again, standard tier keeps traffic local to our POPs and peers near, in a nearby region, while the premium tier, our default, allows full use of the entire network backbone. So behind all of this is Andromeda. Andromeda's job is to enable our cloud customers infrastructure. 
It's a virtual layer that runs over our physical infrastructure. Uh, so virtual machines have virtual networks. Um, in the same concept uh, as how virtual machines provide abstraction from the physical host, the virtual network provides abstraction from the physical network. Um, so our virtual network implementation is called for Andromeda, and this is a layer three networking uh, network that serves TCP traffic. It's responsible for packet forwarding, including routing through immediate routers, and its data plane is a high performance operating system bypass running on a dedicated core that can run over 3 million packets per second. Um, you also have a cloud cluster manager, which performs many tasks, including configuring storage, compute and networking. And then below that sits our fabric management layer comprised of a high level API to configure virtual networks and other network functions. Um, and then finally, we have an OFE, which is our open flow layer, which takes our API abstractions and converts them into programming constructs constructs to program the switching layer. Um, and then the switching layer is really where the cloud and Andromeda network shines. Um, it has a programmable software switch based on open vSwitch and the core data plane for packet processing. So that was a mouthful, but what does this all mean to you? So essentially Andromeda is an extremely distributed environment. It's fast, it avoids costly synchronization primitives, it optimi optimizes memory locality, and the data plane operates without root privileges. So there's a very small attack surface built for one, pers one purpose, and it supports user isolation. So this is essentially what enables our VPC construct for Google Cloud. Each VPC you deploy, deploy means a clear slice of our powerful network uh, with little noise or performance impact from other VMs or other users on Google Cloud. Um, it also enables things like live migrations, which mean that you can actually migrate workloads to other VMs without disruption to your users. And you also get internal load balancing, routing, and VPN features, along with firewall rules and access control lists. So now that I've, I've given you some more context around Andromeda and cloud and how our VPCs are designed for our cloud users, um, you sort of have an understanding of both the physical and the logical engines that power our network on GCP. Let's use load balancers as an example of how you can immediately start leveraging this high performance network. So as you may not, as you may know, modern high traffic websites serve hundreds of thousands, if not millions of concurrent requests from users or clients and return the correct text, images, videos, or application data, all in a fast and reliable manner. So how do you do this in the back end? A huge foundation to make this happen is load balancing, which is the process of distributing traffic across your network of servers to ensure that the system does not get overwhelmed and all requests are handled easily and efficiently. A load balancer lets you do things like distribute load balance resources in one or multiple regions, meet your high availability requirements, scale your resources up or down with intelligent auto scaling and use content delivery networks or CDN for optimal content delivery. With Google's uh, load balancing specifically, you can serve content as close as possible to your users on a system that can actually respond to over 1 million queries per second. Uh, but I will personally admit that on Google Cloud, it can be somewhat difficult to know exactly how to settle on a load balancing architecture that meets your needs and figure out the prerequisites that you need for the best performance without making too much of a dent in your wallet. So the easiest way to think about what type of load balancer you need is, are you dealing with external traffic, AKA outside GCP or publicly facing traffic, or are you dealing with internal load balancers or things that you can run inside your cloud environment, VM to VM, for example. And you also have to ask yourself, what kind of traffic type are you serving? Uh, what layer of the OSI networking model is your traffic at? So here you can see we have HTTP, HTTPS traffic, SSL, TCP, and UDP. And so all of these map to different load balan balancing options that you can choose on GCP. Um, the other sort of dynamic to look at is, is your traffic global in nature or is your traffic regional in nature? Um, so all of these projects, products in our load balancer family fit these various boxes. Load balancers are really important across the entire GCP suite of services, whether you're running Compute Engine, Kubernetes Engine, or you're doing cloud storage. 
whatever it is you're doing, load balancers can be a part of the solution and a part of the network architecture. So I wanna focus a little bit more on one of our external load balancer options today, which is the HTTPS L7 load balancer and how it uses our global VPC construct and Andromeda Cloud SDN layer to help distribute traffic to backends all over the world. But before I talk about our specific features of our L7 global HTTPS load balancer, first I wanna set the context and talk about traditional DNS load balancing. Um, this is a topic that comes up a lot with developers that I speak to. For example, why don't we use DNS load balancing, which is how it's been done in the industry for years. Um, so let's just say you have multiple backends running and they are running in various regions. You, you will probably have multiple DNS records that are pointing to these regions. That means that these regions are siloed effectively. So the load balancer in one region cannot leverage the capacity of the load balancer in another region. So this is a choke point. Um, there are a lot of things in there that are outside of your control also. For example, you could have a failure happening in San Francisco, and that means you'd have to update the DNS potentially. Uh, people then accessing stale DNS entries, uh, and they don't have the most current DNS records, AKA they can't access your application. You're then responsible for updating each regional DNS record and redirecting traffic to the new DNS entry. So at Google, we tried to rethink how global load balancing is done so that you are not dependent on the DNS load balancer to do load balancing. Instead, we built our load balancer as a distributed service across the VMs themselves. And all of this is controlled by OpenFlow using Andromeda. And there are no middle boxes provisioned anywhere in the picture. So this means that there are no choke points. And it also means that we have ultimate flexibility with the network topology. Our L7 load balancer is really powerful. It's the same load balancer we use for Gmail, YouTube, search engine. Um, and it also offers an Anycast IP, which I mentioned earlier. What this means is that it doesn't matter where you put your application instances, you can actually get a single front end virtual IP for all the regions around the world. And that way you get full glo global capacity and cross region failovers. So the big benefit here is that um, if you're running myapp.com in a regional construct, you're at a different IP for every region. In this case, instead, you're using 200.1.1.1 and whether you're in Asia or whether your users are in Europe, whether that you're in America, you're always getting the same IP and behind the scenes, we're advertising a global set of blocks of IPs. So you don't have to deal with the DNS piece of it at all. You no longer have to um, have external IP addresses for each region. Previously, if a region fails, you'd have to update the DNS records. Now you can just make sure that these DNS records are going to get propagated out automatically. Um, so in this case, you only have one IP you never have to do any sort of updating to the DNS records for this function. You're always hitting it in this case. And no matter where you are in the world, you're always hitting the same IP and you're letting Google handle what region to push the traffic to that's closest to your end user to give you the best user experience. So behind the scenes, your incoming traffic is going from client through public ISPs and entering Google's network through what we call Google's front end engines. These GFEs terminate incoming HTTPS connections, and then they distribute requests to the application front ends. And this is where our L7 load balancer sits, which we'll look at uh, all the backends you've configured uh, on Google Cloud. Then it will go ahead and find the closest backend server to deliver requests to. Um, you can see Maya, Bob, and Shen in this example, they're all hitting the same IP, and then they're all getting pushed to serving backends in the various regions. Um, if a Singapore backend goes down, you can see here that Shen's traffic gets redirected to New York or California, depending on the distance and health of the available backends to, to the user. Similarly, one cool thing to point out here is that uh, you can also use Google Cloud's content delivery network, which lays parallel to this load balancer. All you have to do is enable CDN along with the load balancer for things like serving static content. Maybe you have cached static images that you want to sit closest to your end users. Um, then your user's request will first hit the load balancer, and then it redirects that over to a CDN that sits at one of our edge server location, edge colo facilities, to serve what the customers are asking for. Um, 
Some users like to host web servers on Google Cloud and configure their own load balancers behind it as well. Um, and then I just want to talk a little bit about how the load balancer can scale with your traffic. Um, it, the load balancer here, the HTTPS L7, is closely tied to our auto scaler. So what this means is that as your traffic grows, it scales up your backend instances and vice versa when your traffic goes back down. So it actually reacts simultaneously to changes in user traffic, network, and backend health and other related conditions that might happen uh, as you're serving traffic. So this load balancer can actually handle millions of queries per second. And that means that you can deploy backends in different regions around the world and ensure that your system can actually handle the load. Um, this allows you to distribute backends for things like high availability. The front end load balancer will send traffic to the closest backends. You don't have any idle instances provisioned sitting around waiting for traffic. And instead, you can just set a rule so that the backends auto scale down and up based on the load that you're receiving. Um, and how it works behind the scenes is something called waterfall by region algorithm. So the traffic that goes to the load balancer IP address is sent through a proxy to these backend instances. As you can see, they are in different regions. Uh, this algorithm determines optimal backends to send traffic to by taking into account you know, the proximity of the instances to the user, the incoming load, and the available capacity of the backends in each region and zone. The load balancer then distributes traffic based on these available instances. And then to add new instances based on load, it works in conjunction with something we call auto scaling instance groups. And ultimately what this also provides you is DDoS protection. Um, it's, it's really just beyond what traditional load balancers can provide. Uh, this construct is even more highly scalable because we need to absorb more traffic. So we instantaneously are able to spin up more of these software-based load balancers to handle a huge incoming load into Google's network. So if a DDoS attack were to happen, this distributed load balancer is able to handle that without being a choke point to the rest of your architecture. So I've talked about load balancers and how it relates to Andromeda. Um, now, how do you actually build an L7 load balancer? How do they actually function? What does the data model look like? So this here is showing on the left-hand side, um, you have the public internet. This is your user traffic. Then you have a global forwarding, forwarding rule set up. And this is how you forward um, traffic to, let's say, myapp.com slash buy my cool stuff. Um, so you can actually have anything directed to a specific URL forward to a different backend instance. Um, so here you can see that there's a URL map, and this is going to direct them to that target proxy where the actual URL map happens. Uh, you can actually build out a specific mapping. And then those actually map to the specific backend services. So that could be your web page service or your shopping cart or any backend service that can accept traffic. Um, backend services live in what I mentioned are called managed instance groups. These instance groups are scalable, highly available, and they're a way of running uh, those backends based on templates. So these are all like, for example, identical deployments of your backend service. So you basically create a template that has uh, the CPU, the size, the, the storage, and you can create um, an image and an operating system on it, and then just create a template out of it, create three identical instances. That's called a managed instance group, and all your traffic can be sent to those. Um, and then lastly, firewall rules are in place uh, so that you can just control traffic. You allow traffic to backend instances or endpoints, allow the ports to be used by each forwarding rule, and allow the ports to be used by each health check configured for each backend service. OK, so let's just talk about how you actually create an L7 load balancer here. If you're creating this global load balancer, first you create your managed instance groups, as I mentioned, as the backends. And you build it using an instance template that includes the shape and the size of the VM, the OS, the image deployments, and here you have the option to choose a stateless managed instance group, which provides auto scaling and healing for stateless serving and batch workloads. But you can also use a stateful instance group as well. Uh, then you head over to the load balancing console on the Google Cloud page and select HTTPS load balancer. As you can see, there's also options for TCP and UDP load balancing for that type of traffic. And then you get sent to this helpful wizard or workflow but you can also do this through the gcloud command, which is a built-in SDK on Google Cloud Shell in the console here. 
but in this workflow, you can just start by selecting your backend services or backend storage bucket. You can use storage buckets for static content, for example, and set up host and path rules like what we described earlier. This is going to help forward traffic to the appropriate backend. And then for the front end configuration, you can give it a name, a protocol, a network tier. We talked about the premier tier network earlier, and then you select the port. Uh, finally, once you've set up this configuration, you just review and finalize, and you are ready to send traffic to this single Anycast IP. So just to cover some of the features that it offers you once again, um, I think one of the most amazing and unique features of this is that you get that single global Anycast IP, and this can be IPv4 or IPv6, and it runs globally. You also have worldwide capacity. So these are processes um, that run out of Google's edge, and they're very scalable, it runs for Google search, as I mentioned. You also have cross-region failover and back. So if an instance goes down, you can fail over traffic to a nearby instance that you have backend set up in. And then the load balancer auto scales. This is how we handle DDoS attacks and um, do it at speed. You also have a single point to apply global policies. So we talked about URL mappings before, uh, but you can also apply various security policies in conjunction and use something like Cloud Armor, which will allow you to allow or block IPs uh, to the load balancer. And overall, this can handle millions of queries per second. So you have that scale. Um, okay, so when you're talking about designing highly available and visible networks, network monitoring is a big piece of the puzzle. So obviously having the, those backends set up, you have traffic running to, running to them and you have your load balancer as a front end, but how are you monitoring the performance of your network and figuring out ways to constantly be proactive about optimizing your network? It's not one of those things where you just set it and forget it. So every device on Google's network is part of our overarching monitoring infrastructure. We actually collect near real-time metrics through like throughput and round trip time on every host. Uh, and this actually doesn't require any additional software installation. So there's no performance impact on what you're running on Google Cloud. We can measure telemetry at various levels for par a particular VPC network or a subnet or drill down further to monitor specific VM instances or a virtual inter Bases. Um, and how we do this is we actually deploy probes throughout our infrastructure to measure things like latency and packet loss for added visibility. And we actually have this infrastructure set up where um, the network and the host play well together in order to optimize for performance. Because we have multiple paths set up uh, between clusters, we can actually help you determine the optimal network paths using traffic engineering. Uh, and then that allows you to have centralized bandwidth allocation. Um, and then you really just get the most uh, highest performing network because if, as I said, something goes down, it'll automatically reroute traffic to the next closest and healthy backend server. Uh, and that is all determined through some of these policies and the probes that we've deployed throughout the entire infrastructure globally. And of course we want you to understand uh, your services deployed on our infrastructure because from your point of view, you really shouldn't be worrying about any of this. So that's why we're so proactive about, you know, setting up our infrastructure and system. So you have these monitoring capabilities. Um, we also work prior, uh, we also work proactively with our network partners around these issues to minimize impact on you. Uh, and because we have our own services like search that are, you know, serving a billion plus users, uh, we generate and analyze a large number of metrics that come from the internet and that way we're able to collect a lot of the analytics to help optimize. We're using these metrics to do things like detecting and alerting about faulty conditions, um, troubleshooting, feedback loops for optimized service delivery and understanding current utilization and projecting traffic growth as well. But we also provide these tools to monitor your own networks on GCP. So this is sort of an example of a user journey on GCP. You would wanna surface the problems and then you start by troubleshooting your failures on the network. Uh, and the system should also be able to make recommendations to you, have insights to you on how you can really um, change your configuration positively. And then you have an option to either accept or decline those recommendations. 
And, uh, you know, I think on the roadmap is to have more predictive capabilities to allow you to have recommendations. And finally, give you uh, cost saving opportunities for your network services so that you can save money. So we have this really exciting platform or I guess tool within GCP that's called the Network Intelligence Center. Um, it's made up of different modules here. We have connectivity test. Um, this is essentially to allow you to test out reachability on Google Cloud. Um, it can help you ensure connectivity and prevent outages. And then we have network topology, which is a visualization tool. And we have our performance dashboard, which gives you SLIs and SLOs based on the entire global health of Google's network. And finally, firewall insights, which helps you identify shadowed or misconfigured firewall rules. So I'm just going to quickly cover each of these modules um, because they're really awesome. And it, it kind of goes along the path of giving you those recommendations and insights. Connectivity test enables you to evaluate connectivity to and from your cloud resources or you know, in your virtual private cloud by performing a static analysis of these resource configurations. So that way you can actually check connectivity between your source and destination endpoints in your virtual private cloud. Um, you can also check from your VPC to and from the internet and from your VPC network to and from your on-premise network. Um, so that way you can actually find out if you have inconsistent configurations that are not intended or you have obsolete configurations due to configuration changes, or you have configuration errors for a variety of services and functions. Um, and in the back end, it works by creating a model across your entire system, and it runs um, these tests across it so that it allows you to see connectivity between source and destination. But don't get it confused with something like um, Cloud Trace. That's great for in-depth latency reports to surface performance degradations to identify performance bottlenecks. Um, but this one doesn't actually send a packet through the data plane. It's really just used to show you where packets are dropped due to routing or firewall rule configurations. So network topology is a module in Network Intelligence Center that helps you visualize your traffic so that you can monitor your network health easily. It combines um, configuration information with real-time operational data into this single view. So it's nice because you know you can see a list of configurations that you have for your network. You know you have your VPC, you have your load balancer set up, you have your backend set up. But to see it more in this visual way is a lot more um, beneficial because you can then point out, you know, okay, I accidentally configured a backend that's sitting over in US West and I didn't need it. And so it really allows you to have um, that real-time um, telemetry and configuration data. And it captures all of this um, so that it can be represented to you. That way, I think some of the benefits here are that you can quickly view the topology of your deployments. You don't really have to set up any additional configurations. And it can really help you analyze the performance of your network. You can drill down and view various metrics. And uh, this is really helpful in the case that you might have to quickly diagnose and troubleshoot issues. Uh, and then the other component here is Firewall Insights. Um, this is a module that helps you optimize firewall rule configuration and tighten up your security boundaries so that you can better understand and safely optimize your firewall configurations. So in this case, the reason why we built Firewall Insights is like, for example, you might end up having massive amounts of that firewall rules. And this can just get really confusing like you might be over granting or over have overly broad firewall rules, or you might be under granting with insufficient rules dropping traffic. Um, and then there's also human errors like typos and bugs. And so the reason why we wanted to give you an easy interface for you to see, you know, which firewall rules are being shadowed by other rules or which ones are um, incongruent with one another, you can then easily manage your firewall rules, uh, help prevent or fix errors. Uh, figure out you know, where uh, you can isolate issues according to firewall rules and optimize your usage of them so that you can really just tighten up your security boundaries. And then finally, performance dashboard here is another important module part of our network intelligence center. Um, this is where you can actually see all these collected metrics uh, for performance and latency across VMs on, on GCP. Um, there's no manual setup required for these probers that I've already talked about. We've have these already set up on our infrastructure. So we're basically just allowing you to see that information specific to your environment. Um, this will help you allow uh, 
or determine if the network is at fault or if the issue is actually at the application layer instead and not the network so that you can actually deliver cloud um, SLIs per project or you can also uh, just maintain your customer experience and reduce any kind of troubleshooting time that it would normally take. So I know that was a lot, so let me just summarize everything that I just talked about. Uh, we've already talked about how Google Cloud operates off this massive, large, resilient, and very predictable global network um, that allows you to build scalable and resilient architectures on Google Cloud in your own slice of our Andromeda SDN. So you get your own global VPC, and with that comes some of the innovations that we've built because of search, YouTube, and Gmail, like our global load balancer, along with our monitoring capabilities in Network Intelligence Center. And really, uh, we invest and innovate at all these levels, so it's really just being passed off over to you as users of GCP, so you can always optimize and not really handle a lot of things that most people don't want to handle according to their network configurations. So here are some things that you can do. You can set up managed instance groups using instance templates. Um, and then I would recommend setting up an L7 load balancer for external traffic that spans regions for high availability and performance. And finally, leverage our network intelligence center to get deeper insights, meet your own SLIs, and be more proactive about connectivity issues or network performance. Uh, overall, this is going to allow you to have a better developer experience, higher developer productivity, reduce the time it takes for you to actually troubleshoot outages. Um, and you can also uh, you know, get capabilities like auto scaling, and use our load balancer, and proactive monitoring of your network. So I encourage you to really try them out because these are all tools in your tool set. Uh, if you're not familiar with Google Cloud, um, this is sort of the level of abstraction that we give you uh, just based on our breadth of experience in the area trying to build this massive network for our billion plus user products. Uh, you can find out more about this networking portfolio and material by going to cloud.google.com slash networking. And then also, simple plug here, but I have my own networking series on Google Cloud Platform's YouTube channel. It's called Networking End-to-End -end, along with, um, I have other segments like Networking 101, 102, 103, 4, and 5. Uh, and then I have random interviews I've done with networking specialists. So if you want to better understand, you know, what our portfolio looks like and really get a deeper understanding of um, all the components of our networking products, definitely check those out. Um, also, be sure to subscribe to the Google Cloud Platform YouTube channel to get my latest content. We have an abundance of series around scaling, performance, DevOps, best practices, and more. Uh, and then also feel free to follow me on Twitter for the latest on GCP. I am coming out with content all the time. Um, you have my handle here for both Twitter, IG, and Clubhouse, which I'm new to. Uh, and then I have my Medium and LinkedIn uh, handles here as well. Please don't hesitate to connect and reach out with uh, any questions you have. I love hearing from people, and I'd love to connect with more women in tech. I definitely am very passionate about that area and helping others or mentoring others. So please, please, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, thank you so much for joining. I hope that you learned something useful and um, informative about Google Cloud and find out a little bit more about why I'm excited about our network. So thank you so much for joining today.
Next up, I have the pleasure to introduce you all to Natalia Silva for a lightning talk on how to improve your brand by simply following five easy steps. Welcome, Natalia. Hi, everyone. My name is Natalia Silva. I am a Woman Tech Maker Ambassador here in Toronto. And I am going to be presenting you today with my presentation, The Power of Your Personal Brand. And I just want to also thank you for the opportunity of being here in the International Women's Day. I really enjoy the cause, so thank you so much. With that, I want to start my presentation with a quote. And this quote is by Forbes 2017. And it says, today, 80% of jobs are not on job boards. So this might make you think, how is it possible that Jobs are not being posted, but people are still being hired every day. So the answer is very simple. This is possible due to referrals, networking, and most importantly, because personal brands. And with that, I want to start explaining you what is personal branding. So personal branding is the practice of marketing people as brands. It's really your reputation. So uh, if you think about brand, you can divide it by four pillars. So the first one would be, who are you? It's really your brand identification, you and your persona. So think about your values, your passions, your motivations, and think, who are you? And the second pillar would be, what are you? Would be the brand meaning? And uh, really think about your skills, your uniqueness, and what do you bring to the table? And the third pillar is about you, is your brand response. So really think about your story, your elevator pitch, and think how things got to the, the way that they are right now. And the fourth pillar is what about the words like brand? relationships really think of you and if you are a company what would be the mission statement of this company really think why do i do what i do and i believe from these four pillars there is one very important pillar there is the pillar of who are you it's really your brand identification your persona and i realize that most people still have not figured it out who they are and what words, for example, can be associated to them. But my advice is really take time in figuring out who you are. Maybe take personality tests. They are very good for you. And if you do not know exactly how to define who you are, it's okay. Just take the time to really think about your brand identification. And now that I explained you what personal brand is, really think about why. Why should I work on my personal brand? And the answer is simple. It's because it all matters. Your personal brand works for you 24 seven. It really means that you can create awareness, trust, and most importantly, you can create that first impression before meeting other people. And since this is the Woman Tech Makers Summit, I related all of these three uh, points with technical social media, I would say. And uh, about creating our awareness, you can think about GitHub, really how you get your code, you put in the web, and that people can understand how you do what you do. And for building trust, you can think about Medium and really think about how you write uh, a blog post and really share with others the things you know. And lastly, LinkedIn is really a 24 hours resume and it's the way of you creating pressure before meeting another person. And now that we know why and we know what, let's start working, but not so fast. I want you to use this checklist before you starting and really think, do I know myself? Do I understand who I am and where I want to be? And secondly, try to understand the purpose. Why am I putting uh, content together? Why am I working on my personal brand? And if you have this checklist done, we can go to our five steps to create a very strong personal branding. And step number one, create. 
and they can think, how do I create content? How do I make my personal brand stronger? So just think of creating a unique and relevant content. Really think of sharing your thoughts or maybe sharing your expertise. And as Yoda say, do or do not do it. Like there is no try, you need to do it. You can overthink, but do not overthink too much. Just really create. And in a less virtual world, if you are in the office or in college, in person, really think of asking questions in every meeting you attend. Uh, at college, for example, always ask questions. This is a way of you create content. Step number two, connect. And really connect with everyone relevant in your space. Really connect, follow, engage with other people. And you have so many different ways to engage with people. You can comment people's posts, reshare, like, mention others. Mention others is so important, really supporting other people, really helping your brand and also associate with other people in the field. And at work, you can think of networking beyond your immediate team to really connect with more people. And step number three, diversify. Really try to diversify your content. So pick at least two social medias and share relevant content and maybe change the length of your post. You maybe put one short post on LinkedIn and a long post on Twitter or the other way around. And sometimes maybe share a post on LinkedIn with your image and then Twitter, you don't put your image. You can think that you might be being repetitive, but you're not, you are sharing the same message, but perhaps for a different uh, audience. So the same message, but in different ways. And here's an example. That's one of my posts about the I am remarkable week. And you can see in one side, I posted on LinkedIn and there's a photo and the link for people to sign up. But when I posted on Twitter, I just wrote what it is and I put a link. Step number four, consistency. So um, I cannot stress enough, be consistent. When you start to work on your personal brand, you're gonna find your style and really work on your style, find you what your style is and find out what your style is and really be consistent. Think about how you meet people and how you wanna present yourself and be consistent. This helps you to make your, your brand stronger. And a good example is think how you explain something for someone. And then if you would explain something to another person, try to explain the same way. You say the same message. So it should be consistent. consistent. And most importantly, style and message should align. For example, in what, at the right, you can see my profile on LinkedIn and you can see uh, at the left, my profile on Twitter, you can see the banner is the same, the photo is the same, the bio is the same. I'm sending the same message. And step number five, be relevant. So really be relevant. Like there is no, there is no, no trick on this. Just be relevant. If you want to ask a question, ask a relevant question. You don't need to ask a question just for the sake of asking ask a relevant question related to your expertise, join groups related to your goals, comment, reshare, like, content, link it to your field. And remember, you are not giving a TED talk. So if you want to comment on a post about JavaScript, you don't need to write about the whole history of JavaScript. You can just say, thanks for sharing, or can we chat more about it? It's very simple, consistent, and relevant. So now that we know the five steps to make your personal brand stronger, why don't we give it a try? Here we go. Outline your content. Think of things you want to say. And then think about it, how you're going to engage people. And do not rush this part. You really think about what you're going to say. And then draft and do it. Write, read, think, read it again before you post or before you ask a question. And always remember to support others. And with that, as my final thoughts, I wanna really highlight that your personal brand, it is a way of you telling a story 
and do remember that the audience is on your side. People wanted to hear what you have, what you have to share. Also remember that no one is perfect. It might take some time for you to get a bit comfortable sharing your story or sharing your thoughts, but just keep on trying. And most importantly, remember that if you don't define your personal brand, others will do it. So think that personal brand can be the way for you to reach your goals. Enjoy the ride. Thank you so much. And that's all for me. Thank you. Those are some great tips, Natalia. Thank you. Now, joining us from Hawaii, I'd like to welcome our next speakers from Rivacom. Aloha to Kana, Chelsea, Connie, and Brianna. They are leading the way and changing the way work is done, so they'll be sharing their stories with us next. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Chelsea Heine, and I'm the Director of Design Research and Strategy at Revacom. We're a small software development company based in Honolulu, Hawaii. And today's talk is going to be a little bit different from the others, as I'll be sharing the stage with three other women in leadership roles from our company. Um, our talk is called Wahine Leading the Way. And for those of you who may not know, Wahine means um, woman in Hawaiian. Um, since we're all part of leadership in different ways within our organization, we felt it would be a great opportunity to share some stories about our experiences, a little bit about what we do, and some of the lessons that we've learned along the way. So to kick off our talk, I'm going to hand the stage over to our financial um, controller, Connie Shin. So take it away, Connie. Thanks, Chelsea. I'm honored today to stand with these three amazing, talented women of Revocom. Um, being new to the tech industry with only four months in, um, I look forward to continue learning the evolution of the digital world. Um, I can see the values um, the company has um, by giving equal representation of women and men in all aspects of the business. It's also refreshing to see that there's one less barrier to break as a woman of color and to sit with peers that all have great depth of knowledge and experience. Um, what I do at Revacom, um, I don't just crunch numbers, but uh, because we use agile principle in development, I try to incorporate agile practices to improve our financial flow. Um, with the constant changes in the business, I'm always having to learn to be flexible and pivoting based on the day-to-day -day changes, and we can't stay fixed in our current processes. So that's my main focus on what I do on the day-to-day -day basis. Um, I also leverage a lot of what I've learned in my previous experience in public accounting and an analyst of various industries to lead changes through redesigning and strengthening internal processes and policies while um, being able to provide data-driven insights to the team. Um, enough about me. Um, I wanted to talk over about what Revacom does. So we are um, a leader in the agile software development and user-centered design and DevSecOps. We transform organizational challenges into powerful digital capabilities through fresh experiences and great technologies. Our company was founded in 1990 with origins in serving commercial contracts. Uh, we noticed that we needed to diversify. So in, 1990, in 2019, uh, we found our niche in federal contracts, which allowed us to grow tremendously. And with that growth in 2020, we had a 60% um, increase in our personnel. Out of the 60% growth, 45% was represented by women, and 45% of the women were represented in leadership roles. Um, with that, I will segue this to Bree and let her talk more about our company. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Bree. I'm a project manager here at Evercom. Um, I am responsible for product teams who develop apps primarily for the Air Force. Um, and for the air mobility and combat communities, respectively. Um, I'm really excited to share some insights into how we're doing what we're doing um, in our different programs um, and with our different partners. Um, so just a quick snapshot of the product teams that I serve. And thank you, Connie, for sharing um, the hiring stats over the last year. Um, these are numbers from my product teams. Um, there's still a lot of growth and we still have a lot of room to grow. Uh, but I'm really proud of the collaborative, innovative team that we've all built together um, and that, you know, we were able to be intersectional with um, the types of people that we hire and um, the types of problem solvers that want to join the team. So I really believe that we need diverse groups of people to be involved in every aspect of product. 
um, and especially in the decision-making processes in order to really innovate and solve problems. Um, so that means having a people-first hiring strategy um, and having structural change and intersectionality in the way that we um, do all of the recruitment and hiring. Um, having women and especially women of color um, in leadership and mentorship positions, as well as in recruitment and hiring, um, not only does it impact the number of women who are attracted to Revacom, um, but ultimately who interview with us and who are selected to join our teams. Um, and that underlying structure is really key in attracting and retaining talented and um, strong women to any organization. Um, but also in our hiring process, you know, we spend about 60% of our time or so screening strictly for culture fit. Um, that can mean kind of a lot of things to different people, but to us, essentially, that means hiring good people, uh, people who can solve problems and who deeply care about the communities that we're serving. Um, and that's what's really important to us. Um, one of the most rewarding parts about the product teams that I work on is being able to um, impact and spread that culture that I just talked about into the airmen communities that we partner with. Um, I can't go into that without talking about our partnership with Tron. Um, they're a software factory, an accelerator foundation run entirely by airmen. Um, it was founded by a C-17 pilot, um, and Chelsea will be talking a little bit about that later. Um, but their mission is to accelerate digital talent within the Air Force uh, through mentorship and education. And so we partner with them um, to enable airmen from a variety of backgrounds and career fields to um, directly develop these apps that impact their communities. Um, that can range from flight scheduling, which Chelsea will talk a little bit about later, um, to things like AI and maintenance scheduling. Um, and there are a lot of amazing women um, in the DOD that we work with in pretty much every role um, that you can think of. And that's really inspiring to me. And I'm really happy that we can share that culture um, across our partners. Um, and speaking of our partners, um, when we develop all these products, we partner with Platform One. Um, that's where we host our CI, CD, and DevSecOps pipelines. Um, and on that note, I'd like to introduce Kana, and who will talk to her role in Platform One and the awesome work that they're doing. Thanks, Bree. Hi, everyone. I'm Kana Rebolton, and I am the Director of Product Design and Experience. Uh, I am a strategic multidisciplinary designer that obviously from my profile picture wears way too many clashing colors. You know, as a kid, I've always been into anything creative, so I've naturally been attracted to this career path. I've dedicated a good amount of time across the discipline from photography, copywriting, marketing, uh, UX, UI, and strategy. I partner with Chelsea in our creative department, who you'll meet next, and we help guide our teams through projects in every phase. We honestly ensure that we're working for our team in the best way possible to enable them to become better designers and for us to become better leaders. On a more project specific note, uh, like Bree said, I'm mostly ingrained on our Department of Defense contract with Platform One, which I will refer to as P1. And there are some government sensitive protocols that we have to adhere by. So I'll try to keep it as high level as possible. But basically, P1 provides extensive software development services for mission application teams with an emphasis on cybersecurity. Now, how is that impactful? In order to understand that, we have to start with the progression of software in the military. Some of these life cycles and processes have continued since the late 1970s, which is a little crazy, right? Well, within the military, everything that is being built today is software intensive. Most of our country's important systems that aid our line of defense, like submarines, planes, missiles, and satellites are continuously at risk. So most of these government entities that build these softwares are pretty siloed, but basically use about 80% of the same framework. And that's where P1 comes in. They offer massive scale training and security, so teams don't necessarily have to start developing at zero, but rather at an 80% solution mark. So by starting at this 80% solution mark, like this results in shorter development cycles, less debugging, and more uh, rapid feature development. 
And depending on the scope of work on the project, some teams save months, exponential hours of manpower and money by utilizing this service. So what exactly is my role at P1? I focus on the organization's internal and external processes by uncovering all the pains and gains throughout a customer's journey and its effect within our ecosystem, which in this case are the mission application teams that come in. I rely extensively on UX practices and research methods to continuously search for solutions, gather feedback that can better the team's missions in deploying their applications. Now, in this P1 environment, uh, it's mostly men, but a shout out to the women. I'm seeing more and more women in these leadership roles. Currently on the P1 service team that I support, five out of 17 of them are uh, women as product, ma product managers. And then on the creative side, seven out of nine um, designers are women. When I graduated back uh, in 2008 from Cal Poly, the rate of female creatives, creative directors coming out was 3%. And today it's 29%. So we're seeing that amazing growth, but it's still not reaching the capacity of what it could be. I wanna turn it over to Chelsea, who can speak more about her journey as a designer and the amazing impact of her project in the community. Thanks so much, Kana. So hi again, everybody. Um, again, my name is Chelsea. I've recently received the new title of um, Director of Design Research and Strategy. But prior to that, um, I sat as the lead designer on an application called Pugboard, which is a flight scheduling application. So a little bit of what Bree was talking about. So we'll get into that um, right about now. So Pugboard, if you think about flight scheduling or just like the whole field of flight in general, we've come a long way over the past, I don't know, couple of decades. Um, it's incredible to think that we have these aircraft that can fly completely undetected under radar, or um, they can fly as fast um, as Mach 3, right? It's crazy. Unfortunately, the flight scheduling process has not evolved in parallel with the actual research and development of these planes. Um, this picture here, it's kind of pixelated because it's quite old and it, we couldn't really find a better quality version of it. But this is what flight scheduling looked like during World War II. Um, and you'll be surprised to learn that much of flight scheduling right now in the Department of Defense looks the same way. Um, not using chalkboards for the most part, but dry erase boards with magnets. Um, a more modernized version is using spreadsheets, but still it's not ideal, right? Um, so what the way that Puckboard really started was um, kind of like a pipe dream. It started with uh, a guy named Eric Robinson. He's a C-17 pilot and um, he was a scheduler in as part of one of his roles. And he realized that, wow, this is such an antiquated process and really um, scheduling flights for however many planes you need to, there's so many you need to take in things you need to take into consideration, whether it be people's qualifications, their skill levels, what they're allowed to fly, what their availability is. Um, and then if you're doing that for 60 different jets on any given day, it's very difficult to keep track of. So um, he thought, well, there has to be a better way to do this. Um, I feel very passionate about it. Let's see what we can do. So he got a small team together of airmen who um, did some training and they built a pretty bare bones version of Puckboard initially, which um, could, there, in terms of capability, there's a little bit of automation built in. Um, there's some design and a, and a good amount of development, but then they realized that they needed to find a contractor partnership so that um, we could, or so that they could uh, further the development of the product and really get it into the hands of the people who need it to get their jobs done and to save them time. Um, that's when they reached out to Revacom, and that was about the time that I joined the team. I actually um, got hired at Revacom to join this project. So I work on the Tron team on Puckboard as um, the lead UX designer. And um, 
what we really wanted to do when we first joined was take a step back and think about how can we actually get this product into the hands of people who are going to be using it every day. Um, so with that being said, we had to go back in, reframe Puckboard and think about it in terms of how can we meet the needs of our users um, from a design perspective as well as a development perspective. Um, and of course, that meant not only expanding its features and its capabilities, but also expanding our team so that we could meet those requirements and realistically meet those milestones in a short period of time. Um, I will say that within less than a year's time, um, we were able to deploy our first customer facing iteration of Puckboard to um, Hickam Air Force Base in Honolulu, as well as um, Charleston in South Carolina. And that's a really big Air Force, one of the biggest Air Force um, C-17 bases in the United States. So it was really an amazing feat for us, especially considering how long software development normally takes um, in the Department of Defense. So um, as you may know, most most software development in the DOD really follows a waterfall approach. So I think that it's actually estimated it takes about eight years or so for something to go from ideation to actual deployment, which is insane because by the time it's actually released, um, the software is probably not even very great. It's, it's, it, there's been so much that has that's been done that it's kind of obsolete at that point. So the fact we were able to accomplish that within a year or less than a year was really great and was something we're really proud of. Um, when we think about Puckboard, a lot of it is like, why is it different or how is it different? Um, this goes back to being user-centered again, right? And I kind of sound like a broken record when I talk about these things, but it's because I truly believe in it. Um, we were very adamant from the very beginning about being very user-centered and very user-driven um, and not just hypothetically, but really very much so in practice. Um, it's a huge part of our process. It was a big part of our process from the very beginning when we were interviewing people and um, getting their feedback constantly. And we still do that to this day. We integrate air crew um, as much as we can um, with whether it's for new features that are coming out, things we want to add to the system, things that we need to um, be working on, on features that do already exist. So um, that we're lucky that we have a user base that is willing to give us that kind of information and feedback on a regular basis. But um, truly, that's really the hallmark, I think, of how we became so successful um and i mean if you think about it we were able to start off with just two squadrons using it and now we have about 160 squadrons across the united states using it and that again that was within 10 months we were able to do that so that's pretty great especially considering again the timeline of, of how things normally run um and then the second part of our success you know why is puck or different it's really our team and that goes back to what Bree was talking about in terms of culture fit. Like we really drive the idea that um, to some degree we have to be on the same page. Of course, it's great to have people coming from different backgrounds and have different mindsets. And um, you know, we, we welcome varying opinions on things because that's what produces something that's really wonderful. But in terms of just getting along, like we, we really look for good humans that you know, are passionate about what they do, work really hard, um, care about delivering and care about, you know, just care about working and, and, and being with the, you, you spend so much time with the people that you work with that um, it's, it's nice to have it be that you enjoyed spending all that time with people. So um, yeah, our team is definitely a huge reason we are so, uh, we're so successful. Um, and yeah, so Puckboard's really just been a great endeavor for all of us um, in, in terms of like, whether it's you thinking about it as a company or individually, right? Because we were able to grow so much. You saw those numbers that everybody shared. Um, our company itself has expanded immensely. Um, we are taking on new contracts constantly. Um, we're constantly hiring new people, which is like so lucky, especially during a pandemic. So we find ourselves to be so fortunate. Um, and then even just expanding our own personal experiences and um, we're learning things every day, which is, I mean, in my opinion, one of the most ideal things you can have coming from a career. So that's kind of what I have to say about Puckboard. And on that note, we thought it would be fun to do kind of like a lightning round of just a few questions that um, we have for each other uh, to get to know a little bit about the lessons that we've learned along the way. Awesome. Um, and I'll kick off this section. Um, I have a question for Chelsea. Um, I think it'd be really helpful for people to hear about this, but I know that you've had kind of an unconventional um, path to where you are now. 
Um, so how did that kind of all work? And then what advice would you have for anyone who um, also is kind of following an unconventional pathway? Yeah, for sure. So everyone knows I, that I work with, like, I like to talk about this because I think it's really important for people to understand that not everyone knows exactly what they want to do right out of the gate. Um, like Kana, for example, she really knew she wanted to be in the design world right right out of high school probably, or maybe even younger because she was always super creative as a kid. But like, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, I thought I wanted to do science. So I majored in science in college. When I graduated, I just did not like what I was doing. Um, so I kind of dabbled in different aspects of the working force um, or the workforce and uh, mostly did research, but wasn't quite sure what I wanted to really do with my life. And I'm sure everybody can kind of relate to how frustrating that can be. So um, I was actually working with um, the blind and visually impaired when I found out about UX. Um, a lot of our world is designed for um, just people who may not have any types of challenges, right? Like you, something as simple as walking on a sidewalk is something that we take for granted if we have vision. Um, and that made me really angry because I, it's just it's it's things that you don't really think about but it's really important so it kind of led me to thinking about accessibility and what can we do around that so that um kind of pushed me towards ux i found out about it through my friend who was a software developer and because i was complaining to him and he said oh well um sounds like something that you could do with ux so i did a little bit more research around it and i was like hey this sounds really awesome because it incorporates research with creativity, two things that I really love, that I have a background in doing something I could really see myself doing for um, the rest of my life as well, the rest of my working life, right? So um, I decided to take a chance. I applied to graduate school and surprisingly they let me in and um, was able to learn all kinds of things around, you know, it's not just accessibility, but you know, the ins and outs of user experience. Um, and from there, I moved back home to Hawaii and I'm not sure if everyone knows this, but Hawaii's a little bit behind in terms of technology. Remicom's trying to change that obviously. And I think Hawaii has, we have a great opportunity to be really big in the tech world. So I think that um, we're kind of moving in that direction, but again, moving home was a little bit rough too because I couldn't find a job right away. I interviewed with a lot of places on the mainland, but it just didn't really, um, jive with me living here. Um, and I just ended up getting a job at Revocom and it was the best opportunity possible. Um, so in terms of like what types of advice I have for people, one is be to get a mentor first off um, and find somebody that you can really bounce ideas off of someone who's going to be very open and honest with you and teach you how to go about um, exploring what you want in your career and um, just like opening the doors for you, right? Like I, I feel like I had a lot of people open doors for me and I feel very fortunate for that. So I try to pay that forward. Um, the second thing is of course, do not be afraid to fail. If I had given up every time I failed, I probably wouldn't have a job at all. Um, and it, you know, it can be really discouraging, but truly I believe that the most successful people in this life are, um, you know, they fail multiple times and they fail the hardest. And yeah, so never be afraid of failure. And it, even if it poses um, a barrier to you attaining your ideal career, um, it's just a phase, you know, you, you work hard enough, um, everything kind of falls into place eventually. So um, that being said, I was kind of like talking about barriers. I have a question for Kana now. So um, Kana, you've been in the industry for quite a while. You um, are, you know, I can't believe you worked for Revocon. I feel like Kana just joined the team. We're in like a time dilation with COVID and everything, but she's been with us for like a year. Um, so Kana, you, you've been in the industry for so long um, and just thinking about your career, what's been the most significant barrier that you faced and how did you overcome it? Uh, yeah, um, you know, out of college, you know, I graduated with, uh, you know, graphic communication degree. Um, so I was on that traditional path. Um, I worked for a company for six years and had already gotten a, promoted a few times. But, you know, you find love and I got married and actually we ended up moving to the middle of nowhere. 
Um, so to me, that was a little bit of a career barrier because I kind of put a hold on mine to focus on his and, and that's okay. I, I took a few years off, um, and I kept honing in on my skills, even though we're in the middle of nowhere, um, you know, took classes online, kept doing art, still talking to my friends, but you know, that really did take a little beating on my self-esteem when I came back. Um, it was my then at the time husband's career. So yes, I got a divorce. Um, and it was a good one. We're still friends, but you know, when I came back into the real world, I was bouncing around like from friends' houses, even sleeping on my parents' floor for a little bit and then doing art out of their garage. But I, you know, I had a breakthrough moment where like most of us, I feel someone in leadership gave me an opportunity and it was not necessarily because, um, you know, I had the best skills, but the potential um, to get there. And so my advice is for those who happen to shift their priorities in the middle of their career, especially when you're on that path, that it's okay to focus on um, other passions and be able to sacrifice, but still know that you can come back to your career path and succeed wherever you can, as long as you have the mindset and um, goals to achieve it. So I feel lucky that I found Revacom in this past year, especially during this pandemic. And I love you guys. <laughs> um, but moving on, um, talking about, you know, women in these leadership roles. Um, I know, Connie, um, you were kind of the first um, Revacom woman going into these leadership meetings. So were there any barriers for you? That's a great question. So during the there wasn't necessarily any barriers at Revocom, but um, through my tenure path here, I can definitely say there was a lot of barriers with myself internally and externally. So coming out of college, my first real job was in public accounting. And as a auditor, the first, um, rea I mean, relationships you build are with the executive because you need to understand the business and you need to be asking these questions where you understand what you're looking at. So a lot of times in these executive roles, um, it's men, it's men dominated, dominated. So um, being an Asian woman growing up in an environment where um, you're learned to basically not talk back or not to question things, it was definitely, definitely difficult for me to learn to get out of that bubble and that shell. Um, my best advice to any woman out there is to muscle, uh, muster up courage and to speak, um, speak your mind. Well, of course, with reason, and to always uh, remind yourself that um, there's no stupid question. Um, and if it is stupid and you fail at it, it's okay. You'll, ne you'll learn never to maybe say it again, or um, you can learn from your mistakes and any other failures that come your way. Um, I can't necessarily say that I saw myself being a controller of a company. I went through the pathway of being an auditor, thinking that I would forever sit in that audit world and then move on to becoming, who knows, like um, a managing partner. But once that came, um, once I reached that senior level, I was like, okay, this is the lifestyle I want. So I moved on to becoming an analyst. Um, even as an analyst, there were barriers too, because it was highly dominated by men as well. So my bosses were always men. And I was used to being told, oh, um, this is what should be done, but I never questioned why. So I think that kind of hindered um, my career path by not challenging it when I should have been challenging it. Um, and that's, I think, the biggest lesson I also learned from um, not speaking up for myself. Um, but moving on to how women became successful, I wanted to ask um, Bree what attributed to her success. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Connie. Um, so it's actually interesting. I know I talked about the hiring process earlier. Um, this is a question that we ask everyone that applies to Revacom, um, what they attribute their success to. Um, and personally, I can attribute any success that I've had to the people that are around me and that have contributed to um, just my life in general. Um, me and Chelsea are actually from the same island. Um, we're both from Maui, and I grew up um, kind of in the middle of nowhere in a really small town. Um, and I had values that were instilled in me by my family and by people around me. Um, one of those values is um, a Hawaiian word called kuleana. Um, it loosely translates to responsibility. Um, it really means a lot more than that. So it can mean responsibility between two parties to each other, 
um, kind of mutually, it can mean responsibility to um, the land or other things like that. Um, I feel like that's been a huge factor in any success that I might've had, um, just feeling responsible enough to um, take ownership of things and to um, really care about the people that I'm working with. So that's, that's probably the biggest factor for me. And um, on that note, I will pass it back to Chelsea. Yeah, so that's pretty much sums up our talk. So thanks again so much for having us. We hope that you guys learned something from us, learned a, bit, a little bit about what we do. We Again, we feel very honored to be here. So thank you so much for taking the time to listen to our talk. Uh, but yeah, thanks. Bye, everyone. Mahalo to the Women Leadership Team from Rebacom. And now, the final session on this track today will be from Natasha, who will be sharing her story and discussing the importance of disruption and the potential of artificial intelligence to create new ways of approaching old problems. Let's all welcome Natasha. Hello, my name is Natasha Mainville, and I'm a Senior Research Program Manager in the Brain Team, a part of Google AI. Uh, I'm excited to be here today to tell you a little bit about my path and my journey and how I disrupted a path that seemed to be a very vertical and clean path uh, and really sort of reinvented uh, where I wanted to go with my career. And then I want to talk about disruption in uh, your business model and how you can disrupt your day to day from a business perspective and then weave into that uh, how technology and artificial intelligence can play a big role in this disruption. So let's start by talking a little bit about my journey. I did want to share a bit about my personal journey to begin with. Uh, so I have the incredible privilege of having an amazing partner that supports me uh, and really encourages me. And I wanted to uh, hone in on that a little bit because I think that as you progress in your career, it is so important to have a strong support system around you, whether that be friends or family or partner. There will be times in your career when you have to travel a lot. You may have to work very long hours. Perhaps like me, one day you have twin babies and you need a lot of support uh, to take good care of them. And so these are my twin girls, Julianne and Bianca. And today they are nine years old and this is us just before the pandemic in Costa Rica. And I wanted to take a minute to talk a little bit about uh, having children as women in technology. Uh, when I had my girls, I I took 12 months. I stopped and took parental leave for a whole 12 months. And I really had to challenge myself to think about what was my priority. And I felt that that could hinder my career or certainly slow me down uh, if I were going to take uh, such a pause. And in the end, what I realized was it's super important. There's no right or wrong answer. There's no perfect answer. There's simply a perfect answer for you and whatever you're comfortable with. And what I was comfortable with was staying home with my girls and seeing sort of those first smiles and first steps and first words. And, and so um, I, I did take that time. And so today, in the context of a pandemic, I find myself juggling balls a lot because my daughters have been home for a full year now doing remote learning. Uh, and I find myself having to juggle my professional life and working full time and then their schoolwork and taking pictures of their exams and printing exams and making sure everyone's set up. And then, of course, feeding these little people. And so I've realized that I have to choose what balls I'm going to drop. I cannot keep all the balls in the air. And so there's a specific reason why you're seeing this angle today in this video, because I did not want to show my kitchen, because that's one of the balls I have decided to drop. And you just have to be comfortable and recognize that we're living in a really uh, special moment and that we have to be kind to ourselves. And I really wanted to sort of pull the curtains on what reality is. I find we're often presented with an image that is very polished, that looks very perfect, when in reality, if you were to pull the curtain, it probably looks a little bit like this, where you've got kids and you're on a, a, a phone call or you're perhaps on a video conference. And in my case, it's not a kitty cat, we got a COVID puppy. So I really wanna invite you to be very tolerant with yourself and very kind to yourself uh, and realize just how much we are, how many balls we're keeping in the air uh, right now. And so 
let's jump into professional journey. So I'm a computer engineer and uh, right out of university, I went into the financial services industry. And um, I did quite well in that industry. And at that time, my definition of success was very vertical. I wanted to be the youngest manager, and then I wanted to be the youngest director, and I wanted to be the youngest promoted VP. And I had this very, very vertical, sort of climb the ladder view. And I defined a lot of my uh, value through these promotions. And I, I want to take one moment here to dig in on one of my lessons uh, through that journey. Um, who you work for matters. And at that time in my journey, I had an incredible uh, manager. He was the uh, CIO and he was an amazing advocate. He supported me. He encouraged me to be disruptive. I was the kind of leader that was talking about integrating machine learning and AI in rating algorithms in an environment that's very top down and very traditional. So you can imagine that's a very polarizing role to have in such an organization. And so I felt I really had the support to break free from this be polite and people pleasing, be nice, don't speak up that we often see young girls are still being raised in in this um in this way and so i want to share a study that i discovered that i found was really really shocking and it's called the salty lemonade study uh, and in this study they took a group of young boys and a group of young girls and this lovely lady has a great story around here's my lemonade it is my grandmother's recipe it's the best lemonade you'll ever taste you're the first one to ever taste this lemonade and she has this great story um, in reality, they've actually put tons of salt in the lemonade and, it, and it's actually not very good. And so when they presented the lemonade to the little girls, the little girls were very polite and said, oh, it's so good. Whereas when they presented the lemonade to the little boys, they went like, Bleh, this is disgusting. And it really showcases that to this day, little girls are still being raised to be polite and be people pleasing. And that's hindering their progress and their ability to be disruptive in their career. So from my perspective, at that time in my career, I'm on top of the world. I wasn't even 30, I was a vice president. I had you know, close to 200 engineers in my team and we were building incredible new platforms. It was hundreds of millions of dollars. I had arrived at that time in my definition of success, that was it. So now let's jump into my second lesson. Who you work for really matters. And so one day that incredible advocate uh, that I had as a manager decided to retire and uh, I had a new boss. And it is simply that this person had a different leadership style they adhere to different values and had a different version of what a good corporate culture would be and should be. And so remember that salty lemonade story? Uh, here I was, the only woman at a table of all men, VPs, much older than I was. Most of them had a partner that actually did, did not work anymore and took care of the household. And, and here I was still burping babies and trying to make it all work. And um, I was certainly very polarizing with sort of this disruptive mindset. And there was an instant uh, that occurred not long after that manager change that to me was a critical point in my career. And that was that one day I was asked to serve on the board of Ivado, which is an AI a nonprofit organization out here in Canada. And I was so proud and I was so humbled that they, they would have chosen me. And so I informed my manager that I was going to be on that board and there was a PR opportunity and this was going to be released. And when I told him, his reaction was actually to say, oh, Natasha, you are not on the board. He then proceeded to explain to me what a board was. And then he followed by uh, name dropping two or three uh, really powerful men in the Quebec environment and said they are on the board you natasha are not on the board and so for me that was really a, a revealing moment because the person that was meant to be my advocate 
uh, didn't even believe in me, so much so that he assumed that I didn't know what a board was and that I somehow thought I was on a board that I wasn't on. Um, and so that to me was really, really uh, an aha moment where I had to make a decision for myself. And so I put a little quote here that uh, Dame Sh uh, Stephanie Shirley, you can always tell ambitious women by the shape of our heads. They're flat on top for being padded patronizingly. And so at that moment in my career, I had a few choices. And one of them was perhaps to stay home and take care of my babies. And so I want to hone in on an alarming uh, stat, and that is that 56% of women leave tech in the second decade of their career. This means we are losing them when they have the most to offer, when they can shape, foster, and support the next generation of leaders. And that's truly a, an alarming rate. We, we talk a lot about getting young girls interested in STEM, but this is also an angle that we really need to uh, hone in on and pay attention to. And I almost was one of these women, but of course I chose a different path, so let's talk about that. Um, I decided that uh, I had outgrown um, the corporate culture that I was in. At the time, I was really developing a passion uh, for different corporate cultures, and Google was certainly one of the cultures that really appealed to me. Um, Netflix also had this deck out, 124 page of their corporate culture, which was unbelievable. Facebook with the sort of move fast and break things. These cultures really appealed to me and I thought, hey, I want to grow in a different culture. And so I broke free from that very vertical ladder and decided to follow a little bit what Cheryl Sandberg said when she says, stop looking at your career as a ladder, but look at it like a jungle gym and go to the left and go to the right. So I chose the most extreme change I could identify, which was to go in the startup incubator, accelerator, and venture cap world. And I landed a position of chief innovation officer at Tandem Launch, and it was absolutely incredible. It was completely uncomfortable because I, I honestly did not know much about that world, and I had much to learn. But it was such a growth journey, and I reported into Helge Seetzen, who is their CEO, and I learned so, so much from him. It, it was truly an amazing experience. And I wasn't done learning when one day there was an opportunity to join the uh, brain team. And to me at, at that time, truly Google embodied everything I wanted from a corporate culture perspective. I wanted to be exposed to brilliant folks. I wanted to have everybody in the room be much smarter than I was and I wanted to learn and grow from that. And so definitely I jumped on that opportunity and I've had the privilege of growing at Google. I now lead a global team and it has been such an incredible journey and I, I, I absolutely love my job every single day. Um, so I'm, I'm truly happy that I took that risk to really disrupt my career and go on a different path and it has certainly paid off for me. Now, a quick note on those board positions. So it turns out that I was indeed fit to serve on a board, and I did serve on that board, and I still do serve on that board. And I'm happy to report that I actually um, recently um, joined another board of an incredible company that actually just IPO'd and went public. So I was exposed to the entire IPO process, and certainly I was drinking from a fire hose because, again, I was not familiar with all the intricacies of an IPO, but I learned, uh, and I, I feel very privileged to uh, serve on both these boards, and that is really a testament to believe in yourself, understand your value, and always make sure that you don't define your value through someone else's eyes. So now, let's talk a little bit how this courage and this disruption can be applied to your business or your business model. And so innovation is something really tricky. And there's um, a great TED Talk by Guy Kawasaki called The Art of Innovation, where he speaks of innovation as being the jump to the next curve moment. And a great example of that is the ice industry. Uh, so if you roll back late 1800s, millions of pounds of ice were being harvested on lakes and ponds, and they used saws, and they had horses and sleighs to, uh, to carry the ice. And their idea of innovation was bigger sleighs, more horses, a, a bigger saw. 
Fast forward 30 years later, huge disruption. The ice factory is now invented. How fantastic. It doesn't have to be winter. You don't have to be in a frozen lake or pond. You can make the ice centrally and deliver it with the ice truck. How great. Their idea of innovation is more trucks, bigger route, et cetera. Fast forward another 30 years, and all of a sudden we have the fridge. Hugely disruptive because now everybody has their own chill box at home. So what's the lesson in here? The true lesson is that none of the ice harvesters ever made it to be ice factories, and none of the ice factories ever made it to be fridge companies. Why? Because they define themselves by what they did. I harvest ice on lakes and ponds in the winter. And so that's a really narrow box to think about innovation. Whereas had they defined themselves by what they offer, I enable you, my customer, to keep your food fresh longer in your home. That's a much bigger box to think through innovation and to potentially jump to the next curve. And so one can say, oh, Natasha, that's great. That's a really old analogy. You know, we've, we've learned from that. And, and, and clearly we haven't. And this keeps repeating itself. I could give you 100 examples. This is one of my favorites. It's pretty old. And I'm sure you've seen it. But I want to share a few data points here. So when Netflix was still very, very young and they approached Blockbuster, Blockbuster said, very niche, very small. We are not interested. This is quite literally an example of disruption knocking at your door and having such a narrow definition of what you do that you can't even see that this is your disruption. And so a year later, still Blockbuster is saying, Redbox, Netflix, not even on the radar. The real competition is Walmart and Apple. And literally nine months after that statement, they were filing for bankruptcy. And so an interesting point is that, that one of their last competitiveness reports actually said that our data shows that people like going to our stores because they like the ability to open and close the boxes. For those of you that remember the boxes, they were empty. There was nothing in the box. Um, they like the idea of grabbing popcorn on, on their way out, but they also like the... <laughs> The idea of the serendipity of potentially running into your neighbor while you're at Blockbuster. And I thought, how interesting is this data? Where you capture your data, the context and the timing of when you capture your data is really important. And I'm going to take a wild guess and assume that these answers were captured interviewing the person stepping out of Blockbuster with two DVDs and, and some popcorn. Um, whereas, you know, and, and the question was, uh, you know, do you like grabbing popcorn at Blockbuster? Whereas had we been saying, hey, would you have preferred being in your pajama and clicking a button from home? Maybe we'd get a different answer. Uh, and so the lesson there is, if your data is telling you what you hope it will tell you, beware of confirmation bias. There is a high chance that you now have confirmation bias. And so... Let's talk about AI. We've often seen this type of disruption occur through technology. And so one can think, can AI be the next jump to the, cur jump to the next curve moment for your industry, for your business, for your career? So let's go over uh, artificial intelligence real quick. We'll go through a few basic concepts, and then I'll take you through a few um, examples of solving old problems with machine learning. And then we can jump, in, jump into a few sort of day-to-day -day examples and, and ideas to disrupt yourself. So artificial intelligence, it's the science of making things smart. In here, we have machine learning, and that's simply techniques to learn from data. Then there's deep learning. Deep learning, neural networks, we've been hearing a lot about this in the news. Uh, we now see it on every uh, slide deck, uh, pitch deck from startups in the world. It's machine learning algorithms that use multiple layers to progressively extract higher level features from data. And so fun fact, programming a computer to be clever is really, really harder than programming it to learn to be clever. And so let's dig into that. 
prior technique. So I was a developer for a few years. And um, at that time, we had to write down rules. So if I wanted to identify an apple, for example, I would say, if it's red, if it's spherical, if it has seeds and it grows in a tree, then it's an apple. So you can see how that can get really tedious. If it's red, if it's yellow, if it's green, is it always spherical? Could it be in my hand? Could it be in a basket? It's not just in a tree. That gets really, really um, complicated. When you look at machine learning, you don't write the rules. The machine learns rules from examples. So I would show hundreds of thousands of pictures of apples and my algorithm would learn to recognize an apple. And the key here is I need to show diverse images, red and green and yellow in my hand, on the ground, in a tree. And eventually you get a really powerful algorithm that can recognize apples. And so how do you train these models? This is a, a, a really high level representation of a neural network. We call them neural networks because they're loosely inspired by how our own brain works and how our vision works. And so what we do, we would present this network with millions of images of labeled photos, so cats and dogs and cars. And as the image, as it progresses through the different layers of the network, it will gradually start extracting features. So you can start seeing a contour. You can start detecting edges. You can start detecting a feature such as an eye. You can start detecting groupings of features. I see two eyes and I see a, no a nose. Maybe this is a face, right? And, and that's how you end up identifying a cat. And so what's really important here when you're training your own networks is to make sure that your data sets are uh, very, very big and they're very inclusive and diverse to make sure that you're recognizing cats in a variety of colors and shapes and, and uh, areas where you can find cats. And so there is a variety of things that these neural networks can do. So we just talked about recognizing an input, so an image, you know, I can recognize that this is a lion. There could also be an audio input when you talk to your mobile. At how cold is it outside? It's very cold here in, in Canada. Uh, you could have a text input, hello, how are you? And then you could translate that, bonjour, comment allez-vous? You could also have another form of, of pixel input, an image, but now you're not just recognizing that this is a blue and yellow train, you're, you're recognizing context. This is a blue and yellow train traveling down the track. So perhaps you're thinking like, oh, Natasha, that, that sounds uh, really fun, but what can that do in real life other than recognizing cats and dogs? Well, it can actually uh, perform really complex tasks and make really important decisions. And a great example of that is reviewing pathology slides. It's very complex. It's very time consuming for specialists. So when you think of powerful algorithms that can augment these specialists and help them identify that there is no presence of cancer or, or highlight an area to, to draw their attention to a particular area where there could be presence of cancer. These are really powerful tools. And so perhaps you're wondering, why now? Why are we hearing so much about this deep learning revolution and, and, and what happened to enable such a deep learning uh, revolution? And so to give you a sense of just how much of a revolution this is, if you just go back to 2011, there's a competition called the um, ImageNet Challenge where the, the, the concept is to classify images and there's a thousand classes and, and you simply have to classify them. The winning algorithm in 2011 had a 26% error rate. And if you compare that to you or I, humans have 5% error rate. So that's not really interesting. I wouldn't trust a 26% error rate to detect if I have cancer or not. But fast forward 2016, now we're at 3% and getting better, right? This is back in 2016. So we've actually outperformed human vision. Now that unlocks all kinds of possibilities. And so what changed between 2011 and 2016 to enable such a jump? A few things changed. The access to compute, um, there's, there's exponentially more compute available today. 
and it's specialized compute. So TPUs are specifically um, uh, uh, designed to run machine learning algorithms. Another really important thing that changed is we have an open research uh, community, a collaborative community. So machine learning um, researchers use archive to publish their papers. They publish often and they publish early. We're seeing approximately 90 new ML papers published every single day. Um, researchers are exposing themselves to feedback through submitting to top tier conferences such as NeurIPS, iClear, iCML, um, and they're enabling the rest of the community to build on their work. And that's really, really powerful in accelerating uh, breakthroughs. There's also open source frameworks such as TensorFlow that have democratized the access to using these algorithms and building with these algorithms. Last but not least, there's access to data uh, so we are seeing huge uh, data sets, quality data sets, many of them crowdsourced, making them more diverse and more inclusive. And as we saw in an earlier example with apples, you have to make sure that you have a very diverse data set to ensure you have a high quality, high performing model. But that's been a true transformation. And so why should we care? There's been this revolution. It seems the science is ready. It can be applied, or can it be applied in, in, in real life? It, it absolutely can. So AI right now is solving for some of humanity's biggest challenges. And a few examples of that is, uh, for example, there are 450 million people with diabetes around the world. And uh, when you have diabetes, you have a, a, a potential for diabetic retinopathy. And that is the fastest growing cause of blindness in the world. Um, in certain uh, regions of the world, um, folks are suffering vision loss before they even get diagnosed because diagnosing this condition requires a picture of your retina and highly specialized eye doctors have to analyze this picture and they categorize whether there is no presence of, of the disease or there's mild, um, you know, severe, et cetera. There are five categories. And having access to these eye doctors is simply not uh, a reality in many areas of the world. And so remember how we said that algorithms are now outperforming human vision? So training algorithms to analyze pictures of the retina and identify if there is potential presence of uh, uh, the disease and even in which category uh, are we talking moderate, mild, severe. Um, and, and that is being done today. And it is assisting in redirecting the specialized eye doctors to the severe cases and making sure that there is no vision loss before the condition is uh, diagnosed. Because when it is diagnosed, it's actually very treatable and you can prevent uh, blindness. Another great example is, is flooding. Uh, floods are the deadliest natural disaster on the planet. They affect 250 million people yearly, um, huge economic uh, damages. And if we could have early warnings, we could prevent up to 43% of fatalities. That is huge. And so you've guessed it, we can use machine learning uh, to do that. And when you think about, if you just wrap your head around, how would you get flood forecasting? Well, you would need real time water level data. You would need elevation maps to understand how the terrain uh, uh, is distributed. And then you would need inundation models to forecast if the water level rises, how will this water travel and be distributed? And then you need uh, uh, warnings. And so this is deployed today uh, in India and the scope is growing and growing. And alerts are going off with, you know, there's some flood risk, there's greater flood risk, or there's the greatest flood risk. And, th and that's really transforming. And you can really view that as, you know, using AI for social good. Um, other great examples are bringing down language barriers. Uh, if you've traveled a lot and found yourself trying to have a conversation, it's really difficult. But today, using your phone, you can live translate. If you're looking at signs and, and you struggle to understand, today you can easily 
use um, uh, technology to really sort of bring down those language barriers. Um, one final example is, is on uh, farming. And so the cassava plant is a, a huge source of nutrition. Half a billion people in Africa, uh, uh, it is their unique source of, um, of, of food. And the cassava plant can sometimes have a disease. And if you can detect that disease and take action, you can save 40% of uh, crop loss. And so in, in using machine learning, there are a few, uh, there's even teenagers actually coming up with uh, such algorithms, which is really, really impressive. And so you can today take pictures and analyze uh, uh, the leaf and detect if there's presence of disease and then have a recommended action. That's really transformation in the same uh, vein um, you know, understanding that in 2015, the world will have 9 billion people. And in order to feed everyone, we need to increase um, food production by 60%. Um, so that's huge. And in Holland, a few uh, really clever farmers realized that there's a difference. Some cows will produce 10 liters of milk daily, and others produce 30 liters of milk. And the difference is, are they happy and healthy? That was the only delta. And so they put devices on the cows and started analyzing patterns, feeding patterns, sleeping patterns, uh, et cetera, and derived what are the most favorable con conditions to make my cow happy and healthy and therefore more productive. And they're seeing a boost of 30% in production uh, with the same amount of cows. That's really, really, an interesting um, uh, realization. And so you can say, oh, Natasha, these examples are sort of in the inspirational domain, but talk to me about day-to-day -day examples and, and things that, that, that I can relate to. So I picked something from my past, uh, which is financial services, and I picked insurance because I'm guessing most of you have insurance, whether it be car insurance or property insurance or life insurance, uh, it, it, it's part of uh, many people's lives. And when you think about the insurance domain, it is a very traditional um, industry. They still have brokers and they work from nine to five and you have to call them on the phone. And sometimes you have to go to the broker office and you have to fill out tons of forms and, and it is still very traditional. And when and if you have a claim, it gets really, really um, high friction because again, you're filling out tons of forms. You have to go to a special garage. There has to be pictures. A, a claims adjuster has to come to your home. It is a highly complex and high friction uh, process. And um, big insurers are struggling to disrupt themselves. And so a few players have really tapped into that uh, opportunity. Lemonade is an insurer that only is available on device. Um, and if you, you get their app, you can get a quick quote within a few minutes. And start with them, if you have a claim, you take a picture and within the hour, you have your money. Now that is a completely different experience, but they took it a step further and brought in behavioral sciences and said, you know what? We're gonna be transparent about our fixed costs or operational costs. And if the full year, you don't have a claim, we're gonna ch charge you that fixed cost, but we're gonna give the Delta to your favorite charity. And so when you, um, when you get in business with them, you identify your favorite charity. And that's really interesting because fraud is a big problem in insurance and, and false claims or inflated claims are a big thing. And so now you've just created this perception of, if I inflate my claim, I'm not penalizing the big bad insurer. I'm penalizing my favorite charity. How interesting. That is true disruption. Another player is Metro Mile, who really tapped into the new generation of drivers are often not using their cars to go to work or on a daily basis. They're using it for leisure over the weekend. And so five days out of seven, their cars are usually parked and not moving. So why should they pay the same price as someone who's in traffic two to three hours per day? And so they honed in on that and they provide a fixed cost per month. And then it's a pay per mile uh, uh, model. And therefore you play, you pay. It, it, it is appealing because it's very fair. 
another uh, important player was Trove. Trove really tapped into their users and understanding how new generations are viewing ownership very differently. The appeal of having a home or a car is not the same in, in, in newer generations as it was in, in Gen X, for example. So they've tapped into, wait, what does this generation really, really value? They might value a really expensive bike. They might value a great paddle board. And so what if I have this really wicked bike and I want to lend it to my brother for the weekend, but I'm kind of scared he might damage it. And now they created on-demand insurance. I swipe right and I've now insured my bike for the weekend. Really disruptive thinking. One of uh, my favorites is Zong'an. They were, uh, uh, they're based out of China and they're the first truly tech insurer and they IPO'd a few years ago and their IPO is hugely successful, very disruptive. What's really interesting about them, they're not a majority of actuaries as you would typically see in uh, insurance. It's actually a majority of engineers, software engineers. 75% of their workforce at the time were software engineers and their tagline was, we are not an insurance company. We're a tech company. We just happen to sell insurance. And of course, their platforms outperform any of the traditional insurers just in terms of volume that they can pro process because they really fundamentally view themselves as a technology company. So all this to say, if you want to disrupt yourself, you have to jump to the next curve. And in order to do that, you have to give yourself a bigger box. Don't put yourself in such a small box with what you're doing today. You can't be afraid to polarize people. You can imagine that coming out with Metro Miler Lemonade is extremely polarizing, for example, for a broker network. This is why some of the traditional players are not going in that space because they fear uh, that the broker network will be very upset. But make no mistake, it is a slow death, but it is a death if you stay in this very traditional model because it will be outperformed by these new models. Also, don't be proud. Let a hundred flowers bloom. A great example of that is sometimes you put out a product out there and you had an intent for that product and users are using it differently. For example, Avon, when they came out with Skin So Soft, it was certainly not meant to be an insect repellent. But all of a sudden, parents started using it as an insect repellent, and they've just embraced that and really sort of dug into that and are still marketing it uh, this way today. And last but not least, move fast and iterate. If you were putting a product out there that you were super proud of, you probably waited way too long, and you should have been ashamed when you, when you put it out because you will learn much more from these iterations um, and then from, from waiting for the perfect, uh, perfect product. A last thought on um, sometimes, you know, it's easy to say, be disruptive and think differently, think outside the box, but maybe you're thinking, how do I get there? How do I do that? And so I have a final um, tool to share, and perhaps you've heard of it before. I, I love this challenge. If you Google the marshmallow challenge, you will see hundreds and hundreds of videos and pictures. It's a fascinating exercise. The idea is that you build teams of four, you give them one marshmallow, you give them a yard of tape, you give them a yard of string, you give them 20 uncooked spaghetti sticks, and you give them 18 minutes. And all they have to do is build the tallest freestanding structure. I have done this challenge with some of the most brilliant researchers at Google, in, in the brain team, I've done it in the financial industry, and in, in many, many industries. And what the data shows with this challenge, there is a particular set of um, grads that do really poorly on this challenge, and that is the recent uh, business MBA grads. They tend to do terrible at this. Um, there is, though, a set of recent grads that tend to outperform our MBA grads by at least 10 centimeters on average for their structures, and those would be the kindergarten grads. Um, and so kids in this challenge are outperforming adults in a very, very serious way. The only group of adults that actually outperform the kids are engineers, but I think they have an unfair advantage there. Uh, and so you can imagine that many, many folks started 
analyzing what is happening there. How are children outperforming groups of adults in such a serious way? And when you you diversify the groups of adults. So for example, CEOs don't do very good at this challenge, but the minute you inject an administrative partner, they do much, much better. And so there's a lot to learn from this challenge and, and diversity and power of diversity. But one thing that I wanted to hone in is, if you look at how the adults, particularly the business grads are investing their time, they usually take 20% of the time at the beginning to fight for power. Who is going to be the leader? Who is going to be the CEO of Spaghetti Co? And then they invest a lot of their time in uh, building a plan. How are we going to build a structure? How are we going to use every element that we have? And once they've invested so much time in building the plan, well, they have to stick to the plan. And so they build the structure. And when you look at the videos, it's fascinating because they are now taking the marshmallow in the last final seconds of the challenge and putting it at the very top of the structure. And often it leads to an oh, oh moment because that structure will fall down. Now, if you look at how the children are approaching this, first thing they do is take that marshmallow. They stick it on a spaghetti stick and they start building and it falls and it breaks. And on average, children will iterate four times in those 18 minutes versus, versus adults iterating once. And so the kids are learning much, much quicker than the adults. And that's why they are outperforming the adults. And so the lesson here is, again, challenge yourself, have a very diverse team, and think through iterations and learn through iterations. AI and machine learning are producing significant breakthroughs, and they're solving some of the world's you know, biggest challenges. And, and I ask you, could AI be a part of your path? Could AI be a part of the di disruption in your career or the disruption in your business? Thank you. What a great talk. Thank you so much, Natasha. That concludes all the sessions for the first day of our IWD Summit. Don't forget to share your feedback for the sessions you tuned in today for an opportunity to win some pretty cool raffle prizes. Now, please join us back on the main track. The link is shared in the chat so to close out the day one. See you then.